We're continuing all things French the month of July with Escoffier techniques and methods. So one of the things that Escoffier was known for was, of course, bringing green asparagus to, uh, well, bringing the white French asparagus and making the farmers in France, in Grenoble, other parts of France, cover and uncover the asparagus to make it green. The British liked green asparagus, the French liked the white. So August Scoff and asparagus go back a while where he uh, actually incited the farmers to uncover their asperge blanc, white asparagus, so that the sunlight can cause that wonderful reaction or the chemical reaction is so that chlorophyll is formed and the asparagus turns green through sunlight. It's covered, then it does not, chlorophyll is not a byproduct of, of darkness. It's through sunlight, that exchange. And the, uh, the, the British didn't like white asparagus, so he said, please, the farmers, see you play, why don't you grow? And for my British counterparts, I will take all the green asparagus you can grow. And sure enough, he brought that uh, to England. And uh, well, we enjoy green and white asparagus. And we're celebrating also the Tour de France this week. Uh, the great city of Grenoble certainly produces lots of summer asparagus. It's in the market now in certain parts of the US. It can come from France, can come from Peru, uh, comes from Holland as well. So uh, it uh, looks like that. It's a beautiful vegetable, uh, high, lots of vitamins. Makes a nice plate presentation, white asparagus, right? So let's chat about that. We'll do asparagus. Um, we'll simmer or boil the asparagus. So actually, you never really boil asparagus. You say, oh, I have you know, a side of boiled asparagus. Actually, simmer, because if you boil it, the fronds tend to fall off. We don't want that to happen. So we're going to simmer the asparagus in a little acidulated liquid, which means we put either lemon juice or vinegar into the simmering water and some salt, and we'll do that shortly. And we're going to serve it with a sauce, a Maltese, as in the Maltese Falcon. Sauce of Maltese from the island of Malta, uh, way south of Sicily, there in the Mediterranean Sea, or island of Malta, um, ruled by the Moors as they traveled across North Africa in the 7th, 8th centuries on the way to Spain, brought citrus fruits with them from the Mideast. So citrus fruits originated in the Mideast, as many of a lot of tropical fruits did brought across South Africa, finally made it to those islands. Sicily uses oranges oranges in all their preparations. The Algerians and Moroccans preserve lemons. And uh, in Spain, of course, where the Moors were there until the 15th century, this famous Sevilla orange. And of course, the, the various lemons, grapefruit, uh, popular then brought to the New World by the Colombian exchange in the 15th century. So, a lot of fun things in the Mediterranean, a lot of great food. Talk about fusion cuisine. Uh, every country is fused the cuisine of some country. So uh, there's no standalone cuisine uh, as far as we can tell. I mean, there's a blend around the world, right? So we'll make a hollandaise sauce, which is the basis of a sauce in Maltese. So it's a classic, one of the five mother sauces, codified by August Escoffier, of course, in his landmark book, Le Guide Culinaire, The Culinary Guide. One of the five mother sauces, bechamel, espagnol, tomato, hollandaise, and velouté. Holland, hollandaise, eggs, melted butter, butter-bound sauce. We'll prepare that from scratch today, and we'll finish off those ingredients to make it sauce maltese. So it's very exciting and very interesting. And finally, we'll have a nice white wine to go with that. The biggest challenge always is how to match up wine with asparagus and artichokes. We'll discuss that later on in our session. So feel free to chime in, type, chat. We read the questions out loud. I repeat them, answer your questions. We're happy to chat with you and expand your knowledge in our community of cooks. So nice to have you here today. So with my white asparagus, when you buy them in the store, be mindful sometimes the, the tops are broken off. So look to see that. Not too many the tops are broken off or missing. That'll happen. It seems that the white asparagus can be, uh, I guess it stales or breaks off easier than the green asparagus. 
has to be this structure since it's a white, now a white vegetable. As you know, a white vegetable or red vegetables, right? Cauliflower, white asparagus, red beets, red cabbage. All those vegetables benefit from being cooked covered, right? And maybe you know why that is, that you think about why that is. And why don't we cover green vegetables? So the question is, why would we cover white vegetables when they're simmering? And what do we add to the liquid? And what does that do to the color of the vegetable? Conversely, with green vegetables, do we cover green vegetables when we cook them? And do we add anything to that liquid as well? So a few things to think about while you're out there watching and enjoying our show today. So I peeled them. It seems that the asperge blanc or the white asparagus, as it cooks, the sauce gets a bit stringy, so be sure to peel them. With the green asparagus, sometimes we just cut the fronds off. Of course, the thicker the asparagus, the more flavor they have. As they get thinner and thinner, they have less flavor because they're immature. So asparagus are grown, white asparagus are grown without the advent of sunlight. So they're covered with dirt, so you need to wash them. So you want to peel them, right? So we'll peel them. And I want you to know that we want to line up all the tips so they look the same. I want you to know that next week we'll be doing all the summer vegetables, not all the veins we can do in half an hour. We'll be doing aspar um, Escoffier Techniques summer vegetables. So join us for that next week. Can we not use the white asparagus without peeling them? Someone can, can you use, someone asked, can we not peel the white asparagus? You sure cannot peel it if you so choose not to. It tends to be just a little, a little chewy, a little cellulose, a little tougher if you don't peel them. But be mindful that when you do peel them, be careful. Both peeled green and peeled white asparagus cook much faster. So be mindful of that. It's very important. So I lined them up. The tips lined up. Cut off the bottom. What do I do with the bottoms of the asparagus? Keep them for soup, right? And I'm going to tie them up in a bunch. I have my water boiling. I'm going to just take a look and see how it's doing. <clears throat> I'm back, so I'm going to tie up my asparagus. So a little twine. Get a few runs around the side. Then you'll want to tie it. You keep it tight, relatively tight. So tighten that up. I have the water boiling. Make a knot in there, and then we'll be able to drop this into our boiling water. That's secure. It's secure. So I have enough so that you can retrieve it uh, after it's in the water. So that's our white asparagus. Uh, you need the butcher twine. We'll go over to the stove and we'll cook the asparagus now. So. Here we're over at the stove, some boiling water. I want to put some salt. I have about a gallon of water. I want to put about a tablespoon of salt. The reason for that is in any vegetable, there is natural sodium in vegetable. Some leafy vegetables have natural sodium. Some green vegetables have natural sodium. White vegetables have natural sodium. You don't want to simmer or boil that vegetable in unsalted water because then the Water will pull out whatever sodium is in the vegetable. So by adding salt to the water, there's like that, you know, there's no, no osmosis. It's like pulling out the wonderful flavor and all the sodiums out of the vegetable. And it does do that when it cooks, but there's water, there's salt in the water, so it reintroduces the salt to the vegetable itself. So you have a good taste in vegetables. So don't cook vegetables in unsalted water. Of course, unless you have a health reason not to use salt. I'm going to add some nice white wine vinegar. You just happen to have some nice quality white wine vinegar. I'm going to put about a tablespoon of that. I will want a, a cover for that. Now, has anyone guessed why we cover white vegetables or red vegetables? So I'll let you think about that. I'm going to tell you yet. Yeah, let you think about that. And why we don't cover 
green vegetables. And once we add in the water to keep the white or red vegetables their brilliant color. So think about that. I know there's somebody out there, so you'll have to help me, right? It's like the, we want to have all this, as much um, input as we can get, right, back and forth. So that's on the back burner. And on a simmer, I'm going to cover that so it does simmer. So we cover white vegetables. Why? So you, you can fill in the rest of that. And we don't cover green vegetables, why? So you need to fill in the rest of that question as well. Now, did I tell you that we have a trip to France? October 17th, we'll be having a trip to France for uh, eight days. You're welcome to join us. It's lots of fun. I was there two years back. We visit, of course, Auguste Escoffier's birthplace, which is now a museum since 1967. Uh, and it was his grandparents' home, actually quite remarkable. His great-grandson. Uh, Michelle is there as well with us to visit with us. So we have a good time. A lot of great cuisine, a lot of great food. Two, one, two, and three star Michelin chefs. And we have um, visits to parfumeries, uh, haute couture visit. There's a viticultural uh, experience at a, at a winery. If there's a question, just speak it out while I'm talking. So someone said, so they don't oxidize. So, so what does it oxidize? So what, uh, the, what was that answer to which question? So what, someone said, so they don't oxidize. What, um, could you elaborate on what you mean by, so it doesn't oxidize? Which vegetable you're talking about? While you're thinking about that, I'm going to make hollandaise sauce. A couple inches of water in the bottom of the pan. You have a double boiler. Then this works fine. The white So someone said we cover white vegetables so that the, the acid and gases stay in and the vinegar increases and maintains the white color of the vegetable. So cauliflower, right? Cauliflower, white asparagus, covered with acid. Keeps, it, uh, keeps the acids in and intensifies the white color. That's a good answer. With green vegetables, If the converse is true, right? If you covered green vegetables, what would happen? I'll let you think about that while I'm whisking up my hollandaise. So if we covered green vegetables, what would happen? So hollandaise for egg yolks, tablespoon of cold water over a double boiler. You don't cover the green vegetables because if you covered them, the acids would not escape and they would turn gray, right? I remember my Irish grandmother, God rest her soul, couldn't cook to save herself. She would buy canned green beans and dump out the water from the can, put tap water, and she'd cover them and she'd cook them on the stove and I would reluctantly have to go dinner up there when I was a youngster and they were quite horrible. I was only seven years old and knew something tasted bad. So because she covered them, you don't cover green vegetables because they discolor them, they turn green. So thanks for that answer. <laughs> so white vegetables you always cover uh, with an acid, lemon juice, vinegar, uh, any white we vegetable, green vegetable, the reverse is true. No acid, uncovered. Right, that's great. And you want them to simmer, so that's simmering nicely, we're checking them out, I can feel they're still, they're still firm. So I have this on very low so I can whisk and chat at the same time. So for hollandaise sauce, you want to have four egg yolks, a tablespoon of extra large eggs, a tablespoon of cold water, and you're going to whisk them over a double boiler. You can do it over a flame, but you 
more control over a double boiler. And you can see that heat isn't much. A good hollandaise is made over slow heat. Eggs don't like high heat, generally speaking. They denature quickly. They prefer a little warmer, warmer setting. Sometimes you get the eggs over easy, it's kind of tough and rubbery. Cooked on high heat, you do eggs over easy on very, very low heat. Come out really nice. So the same with holiday sauce. I can put on a burner and whisk it quicker, but it's not an emergency. I don't have to make any right away for a customer's order. I can take my time. So this is the best way to, best way to do it with a double boiler. Two inches of water for egg yolks and a tablespoon of cold water. And we whisk that. It doesn't make a difference which way you whisk it either. You know that's cooking because the sides start to cook up. So check the bottom, not too hot. Be able to put your hand on there, and that's good. So someone said, Do you, would you cook the eggs in a double boiler until they became ribbony? You're absolutely correct. So when they're ribbony texture or 145 degrees Fahrenheit, if you happen to have a thermometer. You always know you're on the right track if you can put your hand on the bottom of the bowl and it feels warm. You don't want it too hot. Yes, sir. The, 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 I'm sorry, repeat that question. The what time? Oh, well, all right, we're boiling them, we're not steaming them. So they're in water, and uh, we cook them until they're done. It depends on how many asparagus you have. So you can't say, well, you cook asparagus for 20 minutes because maybe you have 10 pounds in there, and 10 pounds wouldn't cook in 20 minutes. So you want to check and see how the asparagus is done by by um, internal temperature or by touch. Uh, a good cook doesn't cook, doesn't cook by minutes. Cooks by tactile sensation and feel. So they're still a little firm. I'll let them sit in there a little longer. So you notice I took the bowl off the heat so I didn't have scrambled eggs. Yes, sir. Exactly right. That's what this is. It's a zabillon. It's one tablespoon of cold water and four egg yolks. This is the zabillon stage, and you've picked it up correctly. So we, some folks have good culinary knowledge. That's wonderful. That's the culinary term, the zabillon, is what this is exactly. If I had a marsala wine to it, I could put over strawberries. And some rum, I could serve it over some uh, blueberries or blackberries. So yes, this is a zabillon, and it's cooked to a ribbony stage. So how's the bottom? Is it not too hot? So yeah, so you want to, that's a very great observation. This is a zabillon. Uh, if I would add sugar to that, um, and serve it on uh, fresh fruit, fresh fruit zabillon. So see how nice, that's nice and soft. That's cooking very nicely. Let's take that off, let it sit there for a moment. Let's check back our white asparagus, see how they're doing back there. So I'm going to ask uh, Dennis to get me some ice, if he doesn't mind. I'm going to walk around uh, outside, it would be great. And I'm going to take the asparagus off the, um, out of the, the simmering water. So simmering is important. We don't want it to, uh, to boil, the fronds would break the fronds would break off. Thanks, Dennis. So the asparagus is tender. Put it right here. Asparagus is tender. Let's take the other one out. Turn off the heat. Uh, we, we always tie asparagus when we cook them so that uh, you're not retrieving and break and trying to, you know, scoop out like goldfish. Uh, they're all in different pieces. They're going to break and get limp and break up. 
So we always tie our asparagus in bundles so they can be retrieved properly and uh, when the ice melts, and they're trying to fish all these little asparagus fingers out of the water. Come as one packet. And then also for a la carte service, at the club I worked at, we lift them out, put them back into the water to reheat them. Because it's a la carte, we did them ahead of time. And we had them in just a little water, a little liquid, room temperature. And during service, we put them back in boiling water, put lemon butter or sauce maltese on them, and plate them. So that's why we have them in the bundle. It's hard to manipulate 14 little pieces. So those are going to cool off right there. Go back to our hollandaise sauce. So it's still looking good, right? So that's the key. If you added a little simple syrup to that, and pour it into a, added Marsala wine, a little simple syrup to that. And pour it into a glass, refrigerated that, that'd be zabaglione, an Italian egg custard. So a lot of uses for, for that. So get the heat back up and let that cook. So that's nice. As someone said, yeah, you want that nice ribbon stage. You want it thick. You don't want it scrambled. You want any little pieces. I say that's ready. I say we dump out the water. Turn off the heat here. Asparagus is cooling, which is nice. Let's just let this cool off a little bit. This is a place for me to now strain my butter, to drizzle my butter. What is the short time that the asparagus are cooked before the glass is uh, What's the sure sign the asparagus are cooked before we serve them? So here's your, here's your um, cooked asparagus. See, it's... <laughs> It's, it's flexible, but it's pliable, see? It, it was raw, it would snap, but it still has a little toothsomeness to it. It has a little crunch to it. Mm, very nice. So that's how you tell the asparagus done it's by texture, by, by touch, by, you know, those are important things to realize. So there's the zabayo. Now we want to drizzle in the warm butter. So put on your bowl like that and just a little to start with, just a few drops. Uh, can you elaborate on that question, please, sir? Well, well, I do with the restaurant version. Is really don't, well, I guess you could steam it, but yeah, why not? Sure, you could, <laughs> you could steam it. Um, no reason why you can't. I don't have a tabletop steamer, so that's why I boiled them. <laughs> but well, your restaurants, we have the big steamer, the the, the uh, uh, Dennis, give me that perforated uh, steamer pan, if you don't mind us over there. The, the 200 pan is perforated. I'll show you a steamer pan. It's over there. It's a 200 pan. It's perforated. So that's a two-inch pan. It's perforated. And that's a steamer pan. And we can lay um, vegetables in there. So here's a steamer pan for a food service, right? You lay your asparagus in there in bundles. I guess you could. The bottom ones would get flat. But they have a big steamer for that. You have to be steam up a lot of vegetables for food service. You can. Or the asparagus steamers that you buy in the store, those are great to have, right? So you can definitely steam it. So we whisk that butter in. So a few drops at a time. And as it gets thick, then that with a little lemon juice. Drop some lemon juice.
you want to put about uh, three sticks of butter, which will give you about a cup, about a cup of a melted butter. You can do melted butter, you can do clarified butter. Uh, what I did was melted, I melted the butter until it's separated. Remove all the foam from the top of the melted butter itself. And then I make sure I don't lift up the milk impurities on the bottom. So here's my melted butter, right? I, so I melted the butter. The bottom had the impurities, which I don't want to dig up. And I took the foam off the top. So I just want to, 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 to whisk that. And certainly you can put this in a little, little cup, the entire cup of clarified butter. But you want to keep it warm. So if you put the clarified butter in a cup measure, it may cool off while you're waiting to put it. Yes, Dennis? Yeah, uh, well, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, a few drops at a time to start the emulsion. If you add the butter too fast, you're going to see it oversaturate, and it won't be adhered or emul it won't emulsify if you add the butter too fast because it's not able to, to mechanically beat and make the oil emulsion because you have two immiscible liquids, you have, which means two liquids that wouldn't normally be mixed together. You have to mechanically beat it together. So if you add too much oil, the oil, it'll start to, um, the oil will just beat on top and it won't look too good. <laughs> you will have a, won't have a very nice um, hollandaise sauce. So a few drops at a time is important. And also I've done this in a blender too, which is really great. That works just as well in a blender. So we almost have a cup of clarified butter or melted butter in there. And what I've used is uh, unsalted butter, because unsalted butter is, well, without a preservative, and unsalted butter is sweet and is fresher. So that's why we use unsalted butter. So our holiday sauce is getting thick now. Let's finish off with just a little more lemon juice to thin it out. The classic holiday sauce as a scoffee made always had lemon juice. So it's a nice mixture. I think it calls for two tablespoons of lemon juice. If it gets too thick, keep this in a thermos. It keeps well in an air pot or in a thermos. Surprisingly enough, the best way to store a hollandaise sauce is in a thermos. And um, you can put it on the, uh, you can put it like in a double double boiler <laughs> to keep it warm. So you can do that as well. Someone asked, can we reuse the hollandaise sauce for the next day? You sure can. If you refrigerate it, then you heat it, and then you take two more egg yolks and you, you whisk them with the water, as I mentioned, making your nice zabayon. And then you um, beat in the melted, uh, then it will be broken hollandaise sauce because you refrigerate it. The fats will separate from the dairy product. So... Um, Well, it's butter, it'll stay refrigerated forever. The, um, the idea is that you want to uh, keep the holiday sauce for the next day. Actually, you have to redo it all over again, but you can use this refrigerated day. You should have to melt it, take two more egg yolks, start that with water, start your zabayon, and then slowly drizzle in the formerly refrigerated, now broken, now reheated holiday sauce. <laughs> Hopefully you got that. <laughs> so. So now we have the sauce maltese, blood orange juice and blood orange zest. Uh, a little cayenne pepper added to that. I'm going to plate it up now. So those are great questions. We love those questions. Every, those, everyone you ask is a question someone else is thinking about and maybe didn't want to ask, but with the anonymity of the chat room, so you can ask away. What were the last prices? Someone asked, what were the last spices I had? That's a good question. Hollandaise sauce doesn't have Tabasco sauce or hot sauce. Hollandaise sauce has cayenne pepper. And that's what's finished with. Nothing, no Tabasco sauce. Lemon juice, cayenne pepper, and it may need salt. So sauce maltese, a small sauce from the mother sauce of Hollandaise. 
So now we have our nice hot asparagus. They're, they're steaming beautifully here. See that? We finished with that. We're ready to serve up this great dish. Then I'm going to do some wine pairing for you. So you have a nice um, white asparagus. Line up the the stems as we cut them all to be the, the same size, right? And then you want a nappé. What's the nappé of this sauce, Maltese? Nappé, another French culinary term. How does it coat? Is it thin, medium, or thick? This is a thin nappé or thin coat. That way we know you then coat the vegetable as we see fit. So this is really a very nice preparation. The sauce Maltese. You don't want sauce to be like glue. You want it to be sauce, have a nice viscosity, leave some of the uh, fronds visible. Put as much as you like because it's very tasty. <laughs> and then we'll just put a little sprinkling of the cayenne pepper. It's not a hot sauce by any stretch of the imagination. Hollandaise sauce is always served, or many times served, on asparagus. And certainly the uh, other famous dish, uh, Le Jeff Benedict, Eggs Benedict, right? Eggs Benedict, uh, English muffin, Canadian bacon, poached egg, sauce hollandaise, slice of truffle, right? So this is sauce maltese. It has a little orange there, which is really nice. If you're gonna make a sauce maltese on a poached egg, that'd be great. So let's bring our lovely Asperge Blanc today or to the table and we'll uh, discuss uh, a white wine with that and then we'll be able to wrap up our session for today. So what we have are some wines today. We have these Cupcake, I was going to say cake bread, because that's the well-known Napa Valley bread, but this is cupcake. It's from Lodi, Central Coast. Lodi down to uh, Bakersfield, this, the great Central Valley. So this is a Central Valley wine, cupcake. They do um, what looks like a fumé, called Angel Fumé. So it's a Chardonnay, no doubt. And I, I think this would be a nice combination with the asparagus. Keep in mind, asparagus, like artichokes, are very hard to pair wine with by themselves, as anyone who consumes a lot of vegetables or greens, as a rule, it's a challenge to, to pair up wines with, with meals that are predominantly vegetable or grain. Because they're, they're, the fat that they lack makes it a challenge for the wines to, to come through. So when you're consuming, um, let's say a ratatouille, a vegetable dish, uh, it has garlic, it has tomatoes, a Pinot Noir works well with that, but sometimes if you have a green, you're making a quinoa pilaf or amaranth or a harlequin barley pilaf, you're serving some other grains with that or grilled vegetables. Sometimes uh, wines can seem to be bitter, um, certain wines with straight vegetable food. So fats help that. Fats help break down and let, you, let it be palatable. It'd be hard to consume this wine sometimes with, with a vegetable dish, so we prefer using the whiter wines. White Rieslings are nice. This is sort of not sweet, but this is more fruity a Chardonnay. What time of the year is white asparagus available? White asparagus is starting to end the next two weeks, so uh, you better hurry to your store and pick it up before it runs out. It's been on about a month now. In July, usually it comes out. Um, uh, in the early spring, you'll see green and then purple. And then uh, keep that in mind when you cook green vegetables, they should be covered in white vegetables. Sorry, reverse. Green vegetables uncovered and white vegetables covered. But with, this, with asparagus, have the hollandaise sauce with that fat. It goes very well with this uh, cupcake chardonnay. So it's a nice balance. Uh, having uh, vegetables and greens, dark wines, kind of rough on the palate. There's also a, we have a, a Pinot Noir that they make in the Bordeaux bottle, so it's probably a Cabernet. They call it red velvet. So it uh, doesn't say the grape variety, so I'm thinking it's 
it's in a Cabernet bottle. So it must be like a Bordeaux-like wine, so Cabernet Sauvignon wine. You can tell the shape of the bottle, tells the kind of wine it is. So that's a Bordeaux bottle, that's a Burgundy bottle. So drier, more robust, a little more mellow, more fruit in the Burgundy bottle. Of course, Chardonnay is a, a grape from Burgundy, France. So uh, chilled, 55 degrees is best for uh, certain wines, your better quality wines, not as cold, uh, 60 degrees. Sometimes the less expensive, the colder it needs to be for various reasons. Where did you purchase the cupcake wine from, Chef? What did you order them online? Well, there's a website on here, uh, Lazy Le Manger La Ghetto, which means let them eat cake. But actually, the, it says cup, cupcakevineyards.com. Thank you. I didn't have my glasses on. Somehow I read that. So cupcakevineyards.com. Uh, certain states allow shipping by mail, right? And some states do not. So it depends on your locality. But it's a nice combination when you look at the, the nice um, grapefruit color. Grapefruit color of this, uh, of this white wine, hopefully a clean white towel. You see the nice color of the, uh, of the wine itself. It's a, a light grapefruit color. Actually has a nice grapefruit nose to it. Very fresh and goes great with this asparagus maltese. And a nice looking sauce. So, any last questions? We're happy to take them now. And uh, as we wrap up today's session, keep in mind next week we'll be doing Escafe Techniques Summer Vegetables. And the week after that will be Escafe Techniques uh, Beef. Then we'll do veal, pork, fish, chicken, and on and on. All the great Escafe Techniques that you'd like to learn here at our, our show each week. What will be a good green garden? So someone know what would be a good green garnish for the asparagus? You don't want something no one eats. No one eats parsley or, or mint or watercress would be nice on here. That would work well. Or I would put um, the microgreens or frise. That's a great suggestion. Frise would be nice or microgreens are beautiful. Avoid parsley, kind of old, old hat. Watercress is nice. Peppercress, mini peppercress would be beautiful on here. So I'm going to wish you bon appetit. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Um, have a great day and happy cooking. Bye-bye.